Mr. Ruslan Karkin. Big round of applause. Well, it all started in my parents' garage. I had no money at all, and I started an online business, Kogan.com.au. Ruslan Kogan is making enemies with the big retailers. And the more competition there is, the consumer's going to benefit. They're a whole lot cheaper. The LED TV price war has started, and we're ready. He's built his business empire online. He joins us now, Ruslan. <laughs> Gen Y, what do you think? I think that the way that we communicate is changing. A customer's going to go for it. The whole Kogan business is all about giving customers exactly what they want. How is it that you're able to undercut your competitors by so much? Virgin Galactic sending people out into space. It's a business that I respect and it's what Kogan does. It's innovating in a new marketplace. I want to talk about today. So I'll talk about uh, entrepreneurship in general, what you know an entrepreneur means to me, the Kogan startup story, and then lessons that I've learned along the way with uh, the Kogan business. So just tweet at ruslankogan.com, uh, at Ruslan Kogan, and um, I'll take questions as we go. Kogan started six years ago with zero dollars startup capital and has had zero dollars of external investment to date. It's experienced 500% growth in our last year, which is our sixth year. And last week we hit, or we had our first million dollar day of sales. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we actually smashed it. We hit a million dollars by 8 p.m. But um, it was that million dollar mark that we hadn't reached in any given day up until then. Now for a business that a year and a half ago was a $22 million a year turnover business, that was a significant amount of growth and we're looking forward to many more years of similar growth. What is an entrepreneur? So I've heard various definitions, but I guess it's what it means to you. But to me, an entrepreneur is twofold. It's an inventor and an athlete in one, which is probably why you see me in quite a few uh, Nike t-shirts. Um, an entrepreneur is an in inventor because they have to look at the marketplace and they have to say, what can I do differently? What can I invent? What interactions can I change? How can I make this more efficient? What can I do to improve this experience for customers? What can I do to improve this experience for businesses? They have to do something different to what everyone else before them has done. Otherwise, they'll have no competitive advantage at all. So it's this element of inventing something in the marketplace that is crucial to an entrepreneur. They have to think differently to everyone else before them. Now, the athlete bit comes into it because after you've got that awesome idea, after you've got that concept, after you've created that competitive advantage, you have to work your ass off to make it happen. And you know, in the same way that you'll see athletes training 15 hours a day for four years leading up to the Olympic Games, or maybe not an Australian athlete because they haven't done too well, but you know, Chinese or American athletes. <laughs> you know, that, that element is crucial to an entrepreneur. Now, when I used to tell the Kogan startup story, it always used to start in 2006, because 2006 is when I registered the business name and started Kogan. Recently, I realized that Kogan and the inspiration for it actually started in 1989. Uh, I was five and a half years old when my parents uh, migrated from old communist Soviet Union to Australia. And the reason I say Kogan started is in 1989 is because I was at an Entrepreneur Awards recently and I was a year and a half ago or something and it was an Entrepreneur of the Year Award they had all the finalists on the table and I looked at, at the list and everyone's name was Russian who'd been a finalist this is an Australian Entrepreneur of the Year Awards and all the finalists are Russian so I thought that's a bit weird you know I thought at that point I was like I definitely didn't pay off the judges enough prior to now 
And, and then I ended up winning the award to my surprise, got up on stage and I told the MC, I was like, look, it's interesting that uh, everyone was Russian uh, who'd made the finals. And the MC said to me, why do you think that is? And I had no idea, I cracked the joke. I said, maybe it's got something to do with vodka, I don't know. <laughs> and then the MC asked me like, you know, your parents in business, did you learn your business skills from your parents? And I said, nah, they didn't teach me anything. Um, my, <laughs> anything in terms of business. <laughs> so, you know, my parents are both per hour employees, my dad's a factory worker, you know, mum's worked at cafes and as a cleaner, you know, however many hours they work, that's how much they get paid. They grew up in communist Russia, they have no idea about uh, market forces like supply, demand, they have no idea about opportunity cost. Like my mum will come back and say, oh look, I bought this skirt for 50 bucks that was 200 bucks, I just saved 150. And I'd be like, did you save 150 or did you waste 50? You know, <laughs> if, if people were buying the skirt at $200, do you think the store would have discounted it to 50 bucks? Nobody was paying 200 for it. A transaction and the cost of something is the level at which a transaction occurs, which is the $50. And then, you know, we live in Elstonwick and my mum would drive, we've got a Coles up the top of our street. My mum would drive to the Dandenong markets to buy fruit and veg. And I'd be like, mum, why are you doing that? And it's like, oh, it's cheaper in Dandenong. And I was like, and how much do you earn per hour and how much does petrol cost? And when you factor in the fact she has to waste two hours going to Dandenong and back and the fact that, um, you know, she could have worked an extra hour or two at work. She's actually losing money by doing all this extra effort to go to Dandenong. So, communist Russia doesn't really teach you the best of business skills. <laughs> and, and so, you know, after I got off stage and, you know, said, yeah, I didn't learn my business skills from my parents, a guy came up to me, an elderly gentleman, took me aside and he says, you know what? You got or your business drive from your parents. And I was stunned and I was like, what do you mean? I said, think about what it takes to be an immigrant. You have to drop everything you've got. You've got to take a massive risk, travel into the unknown, work your ass off to try and make ends meet for a potential benefit that might not even be there. And at that point I was like, shit, I did get all my business skills from my parents. <laughs> I grew up from as soon as we landed in Australia, watching my parents work three to four jobs a day while studying English at the same time, whilst trying to, you know, educate two kids. I saw my dad go from delivering pamphlets to being a taxi driver to, you know, make, doing other jobs at Vic Market and whatever, any job anyone offered him. I saw my mum go from being a, caf a cleaner at one cafe to a waiter in another cafe, then coming home learning English, trying to spend time with kids and things like that. And I guess that's the drive you need to be an entrepreneur. Anyone who thinks that, yeah, you know, if I become an entrepreneur, that's my way to, you know, uh, financial freedom, I won't have to work as much, I don't report to anyone and all of this, that's all crap. I went from reporting to one person at Accenture, one boss, to now reporting to 82 million people. Every single move we do is under scrutiny. I work more than I've ever worked in my life. So uh, that's, that's the basics of when Kogan started, 1989, when I saw my parents do that move. Since then, uh, growing up and being in the supermarket and you know wanting footy cards and wanting a Mars bar and being told, no, we can't afford that, no, we can't afford that, I realized from a young age that if I wanted something, I'm gonna have to earn it myself. So I've run about 20 businesses since the age of nine. Everything from collecting and selling golf balls to a car wash business to a website design business through high school to a mobile phone repair business and many, many others. I've always loved technology. I wanted a computer from a young age. So I convinced my dad to use the money that he was getting from delivering pamphlets to take me to a computer swap meet and I was able to buy secondhand components to put together a computer cheaper than the stores were selling them for. So at the age of nine I was very excited to have a 386 computer with 256k of RAM and then one of the happiest days in my life was when I saved up enough money to upgrade it to 512k of RAM and install Windows 3.1. So. <laughs> 
I've always loved technology. I got into Monash on a scholarship to study business systems, which is an IT slash business degree, and then managed to convince my course director in my final semester to let me study abroad and go to Miami and exchange serious IT subjects for things like golf and scuba diving. So uh, that was all pretty good. Now, I arrive in Miami and you know, we settle in and all the international students are together and we're like, well, in order to make this a successful semester, we're going to need a mini bar fridge for our dorm rooms. So we set out to buy a mini bar fridge. Where were we going to buy it from? The place that uni had told us is the best, Walmart. Walmart's got economies of scale. They're the biggest. No one can compete with Walmart. Their marketing's the best. Their distribution's the best. Everything's awesome. You'll get the best prices and the biggest range. So we set out on a full day excursion. We caught a bus and a train to Walmart, picked out our bar fridge, then had to schlep it back on the bus and the train carrying it. We spent a whole day in Miami heat uh, carrying bar fridges back to our dorm rooms. But at the end of the day, we had a hard-earned thirst and we had somewhere to keep our beer cold. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, no VB there, but, um, you know, it was, we were set for a successful semester. Our beer was going to be cold. Then we, the next day, we see American kids and they were doing it, you know, much easier. They'd spent the previous day chilling by the pool, working on their suntan, getting ready for the semester. And we see FedEx drivers just wheeling bar fridges to their door. And I'm looking at like, fuck, that would have been so much easier. <laughs> and then we end up talking to the American kids and realise that not only did they get to spend all of yesterday by the pool, they paid half the price that we did. And at that point, uh, you know, in the back of my head, I had a few things going on and I thought, oh, awesome, a small online retailer can operate with far greater efficiency than a Goliath like Walmart. So I kept that thought floating around in the back of my head and continued on with the semester of studying slash drinking and partying. So finished up in Miami, meant my degree was finished, fly back to, oh, went on a bit of a trip around Europe and Thailand, fly back to Australia and uh, I took up a job at GE. Now at GE, I had, I'd worked there as a student for a bit. I had a unique skill set. I was a, a CCIE, which is a Cisco certified internetworking engineer. Uh, there were hardly any of these sort of people in Australia. I'm not sure how many there are now. But I was on a pretty decent wicket there. Because of this specialized skill set, I was earning about 150K a year as a 21 year old. So things were going all right. And then, you know, Accenture started marketing to me. And they were sending me all these brochures about, you know, a consulting career and how good it would be, um, you know, being a consultant and working on all different projects. And they were sending me brochures that had people working on laptops in luscious green parks and lakes and all of that. And I used to look at those brochures and think, that is so awesome. That, that's the sort of job that I want to be doing. I want to be in a park on a laptop. <laughs> so then I you know, went, went for the job at Accenture, got the job, and then had the decision to make, do I, do I quit my 150K a year job at GE and go work at Accenture? Or do I stay at GE? Now everyone, my parents and grandma, everyone was like, you're stupid, stay at GE. But after a bit of thinking, I thought, nah, I need this whole parking and laptop lifestyle. <laughs> I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go take up this grad position at Accenture as a management consultant. So, started working at Accenture and I absolutely hated it. Accenture is like the McDonald's for smart people. It's this... <laughs> It's this process-driven organisation with a process for everything. In the interviews, they'll tell you, it's all about innovation, creativity, this, that. And I'm like, how are you meant to create or innovate when you're told, do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. Don't veer away from that. And so, yeah, you know, was working at Accenture for a few months. And then a few things happened at the same time. So I was on a project at Accenture where uh, there was a bunch of grads and we had to migrate data from one system to another. There were about 100,000 records, and they gave us 10,000 records each on a Monday morning, and said, go migrate these from this format to this format. 
And I thought, all right, fine. Took that task to my desk. I worked out a pattern in the data. I wrote a script that did it in half an hour. By 9.30 that day, I went to have a chat to my manager and I said to her, you know, hey, look, uh, there's a quicker way to do this task. I've done it in half an hour. Have a look. It's all correct. She's like, there's no chance you could have done that task. There's no chance you could have finished it that quickly. Go do it properly. Refuse to even look at my work. And I said, I have done it. Please look at it. She was like, go back to your desk. I thought, fine. Uh, at the, that time, I was selling a few bits and pieces on eBay here and there. So I thought, sweet, you know, four and a half days to, to browse around <laughs> eBay. <laughs> At roughly the same time, I was looking for an LCD TV. I've always loved the latest tech, and I thought, all right, well, I need, I need an LCD TV. I'm going to go buy one. So I go around the big stores, and even though I was earning some decent coin at the time, I couldn't afford an LCD TV. So as you do, I started sending emails to a few big Chinese factories saying, hi, I'd like to order 100,000 LCD TVs. Please provide your best price. <laughs> So they all started replying, and then I got all these quotes back, and I saw, shit, for the price that I could land a 32-inch TV at that time was around $1,000. The big-name stores were selling them for about $3,000. I'm like, that's a massive gap in the marketplace. So um, there's definitely opportunity here to do what I just saw in Miami and have an online retail business that, that sells this stuff cheaper. So, I went, uh, I went along and continued the discussions and everything was legit. These were all you know, big name factories manufacturing TVs using Samsung and LG panels and you know, identical technology to what the other stores were selling, but just this massive gap in the marketplace. So I thought, that's it, I'm going to go do this business. My parents, once again, were against it. My mum was like, you've got this awesome job, you've got the degree, you've got an education, now you're going to be a TV salesman. <laughs> And I was like, no, mum, don't worry. It's like, you know, I have to give this a crack. And I went in to work on that Wednesday. And I, you know, I like to be a bit risk averse, you know, take calculated risks when you need to. So I took my manager aside and I said, hey, I'm going through a few personal issues at the moment. Uh, can I have one year leave without pay? <laughs> And the manager was like, no, you can't have a year leave without pay. You've only been here six months. Essentia doesn't do one year leave without pay, blah, 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 blah. I was like, all right, well, then I want to resign. And I know my contract says I've got to give you 28 days notice. I never break agreements. I want to keep my agreement. I can give you 28 days notice. But if you agree to let me off earlier, that would be really appreciated. So, so the manager goes to me and says, oh, yeah, that's fine. You can just finish up today. It's fine. You know, don't worry about it. Uh, which to me was like, whoa, you know, really appreciated here. That's really nice. <laughs> but I thought, sweet, I can, get, I can get this TV business up and running. So I, um, I came home that day and started working on Kogan, started making the website as per the pictures and specs I'd received from the manufacturers, started doing the listings, you know, and by Sunday, the, everything was ready. Kogan was up and running. We were all set to go. Now, the only problem was that I had absolutely no money in the bank and couldn't place an order with any factory. So around the same time, I went. My parents had just built a house, and my mum wanted me to come along with her to help her buy a dining room table. So we rock up to a furniture store. She sees a dining room table that she likes, and. And, you know, she says, yeah, I want to buy that one. They go to the counter. The guy takes her address, processes the payment, and then says, Mrs. Kogan, this will be delivered in 50 days, and tells her the date when it will be delivered. My mum was like, thank you very much. All really happy. She bought the dining room table, and we walk out the store. And I was like, mum, um, you just paid for something that's not getting delivered for 50 days. Why did you pay for the dining room table? And my mum goes to me, oh, don't worry. That's just how it works. And I thought, if that's just how it works, and that's just how it works. So, 
I went back to the website I made and, you know, for each TV I said, you know, will be delivered in 45 days and put the dispatch date on there and I knew that to have these TVs manufactured would be about 25 days plus about 15 days of shipping and I'm laughing. So I started selling the TVs that I hadn't even ordered yet. <laughs> now, all of a sudden I've got them on the website, people are coming through and buying them. And people are, you know, weighing up the options and seeing, all right, well, this TV for 1100 bucks compared to a $3,000 option, I've never heard of this brand, but it seems like a good deal. I set up a 1300 number that kept going to my mobile, so it looked like a professional company. The website looked awesome. And I, I'd answer the phone with a different name all the time. Hi, thank you for calling Kogan. This is Tim. Hi, thank you for calling Kogan. This is Roger. <laughs> So on all the emails, I was replying as chicks, you know, hi, thank you very much, kindest regards, Lucy, yes. <laughs> Which becomes a bit awkward when a customer asks you out on a date. Um, you know, thank you very much, this is Sandra, and all that. No one ever complains to a chick. And um, <laughs> so all of that was gone sweet. So if you were considering a Kogan TV, sent us two or three emails and made a couple of phone calls, you're like, fuck. These guys are massive. I've dealt with like eight different people already. <laughs> and they've got a 1300 number, and the logo looks cool, and the website looks sweet, you know, deal. So people started buying it. Within a couple of days, I'd had enough for a deposit to pay to China. Everything was running on time, everything smooth. I started selling the TVs on eBay at one cent, no reserve as well, where I got to control exactly how many I sell. And, you know, the funny thing is, people are like, are people going to, you know, what if you sell a TV for two cents? And I was like, does that mean no one in Australia is willing to pay three cents? And what people don't realise is you rock up to an auction that starts at 500 grand and it ends at 625 grand. If that auction had started at one dollar, it would still end at 625 grand. So as long as you've got a natural market and demand and at least two people that want a product, you're going to get the right market price for it. So the TVs were selling, I could control sales, everything was going great. So I emailed the factory and I'm, hi, thank you very much, I've selected you for this order. The only thing is, before I order 100,000 TVs, I want to place a trial order for 80 TVs, which is one container. And I don't know how many of you have dealt with China, but China's all about mass production. It's all about economies of scale. It's all about efficiencies. They're not interested in one container of 80 TVs. So the factory replies to me, pretty much laughing, saying, hi, Mr. Kogan, received your email. We can't cooperate with you. We would lose money at making 80 TVs. Uh, you know, it's 10 minutes of our production line. So I thought, <laughs> so shit, I've now, I've now got all these people that have bought the TVs and I need to deliver the TVs. So I lost a couple of nights sleep thinking, how do I make this a win-win between me and the factory? It, commercially, it's not viable for them. They, they're not going to make any profit off this order. What can I do to enable them to make, um, you know, a win-win scenario with this order? And then it hit me. I don't know how many of you have dealt with China. But this was a multi-billion dollar factory I was dealing with, and all of their documentation was in Chinglish. <laughs> None of the product brochures made sense. They had images all over the place. The pricing spreadsheets had numbers centered in 12 different fonts. Nothing was aligned. The user manuals didn't make sense. They were missing images and diagrams. And none of it looked like a quality Accenture document. <laughs> So, you know, I stayed up for a couple of days and redid all of it for them. I redid all of their product brochures, I redid all of their pricing spreadsheets, user manuals, and made it look like a professional Western document in English. And I sent it back to them and I said, hi, look, I understand commercially there's not much of an incentive for you to work with me, but there's other ways in which I can add value to this transaction and attached all of the stuff I'd redone for them. Within a couple of hours, they responded saying, Mr. Kogan, thank you very much. We accept your order. And they gave me an even better price than we had negotiated for 100,000 TVs. So smooth sailing once again. Everything's back on track. This factory emails me a week later saying that because of 
what I had done for them. They had just won a massive customer in the US that had told them they were by far the most professional factory out there. So, <laughs> created a win-win scenario. I'm sure they made enough profit off that American customer to cover my order. Um, so everything was smooth sailing once again. TVs were being sold. I used the money that I'd, from the TVs I sold already to pay the deposit payment to the factory and the balance payment was due in a few weeks. The TVs were selling on eBay. They were selling on the website. Getting lots of calls throughout the day. Everything's going very well. Until I wake up one morning to a couple of emails. One email is from eBay saying, Dear Mr. Kogan, We've noticed some irregular activity in your eBay account. You have sold a high volume of products for which you have not received any feedback. We see your account as high risk. We have suspended your account and we will reactivate it once we receive feedback come through for those items. So I thought, shit, that's one of my sales avenues shut down. And then I received the email from PayPal, pretty much saying the same shit as the PayPal email except it ended in, we have now frozen funds in your PayPal account that will be unfrozen when you start receiving feedback for these transactions. So far out, why didn't I just withdraw it all yesterday? <laughs> so yeah, so PayPal had locked up a lot of money and I lost one of my sales avenues and I was about a week away from the balance payment being due, otherwise I couldn't fulfill all the orders. Luckily, this was all around a time in 2006 where banks were happy to give credit cards to every man and his dog. So I set up my Firefox, Firefox auto form filler out or a thing to, you know, I had applying for a credit card, I had the process perfect. I could do it in under a minute. Um, it was all auto pre-filled. So every banner ad I'd see for a credit card, I'd click on it, have the form auto filled out, hit submit. So applying for absolutely every credit card possible. Within a few days, an unemployed 21-year-old, 23-year-old at the time, an unemployed 23-year-old had received about $50,000 worth of credit cards in the mail. Sweet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so things were on track. I was still just that little bit short, so I told a few friends of mine, hey guys, you know, it's really easy to get credit cards. Can you help me out, please? <laughs> And a few of my mates went and applied for credit cards and then, you know, we all went into the banks in one day, took out full cash advances on every single credit card. They gave me all the money and then I went and made the telegraphic transfer to China to pay the balance payment for the order. So, back on track. Everything smooth sailing with the project. Only problem is my balls were on the line by this stage. I owed heaps of customers TVs, I owed heaps of banks money, I owed heaps of friends money and I had to make sure that everything went right. So I jumped on a plane to go to China. Got to the factory, saw the produced TVs, hand tested every single one of the TVs myself. You know, switched it on, tested absolutely every single function. Ensured that they worked. Then oversaw the TVs being loaded into the container and that all went sweet and that all worked out. Then I jumped in a taxi and made the taxi follow the container to the shipping yard. <laughs> I've absolutely no idea what I was going to do if the container got attacked, but... <laughs> I'd, watched, I'd watched one too many movies with dudes with AKs and, you know, holding up a container, robbing it and all that, so... I don't know. But, you know... It all went smooth sailing, no need for a Jack Bauer special move and um, the container got to the shipping yard. The container then arrived in Australia, shipped the TVs out to the customers, everyone was really happy. They left positive feedback on eBay, eBay reopened my account, PayPal released the money, paid back all my friends, paid back all the credit cards, made a bit of profit and the next order no longer had to be a 45-day pre-sale because I had a bit of profit to get that order kick-started. It was a 30-day pre-sale. The next one was a 15-day pre-sale. The one after that wasn't a pre-sale at all. We had stock already in the warehouse. Now, Kogan has a 10,000 meter, 10,000 square meter warehouse facility out at Laverton, chock-a-block full of TVs, plus 50 to 100 containers of TVs on the water at any given time. 
Um, yeah, so things turned out all right.